Welcome to the Goddard Report. Comments made on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com are an expression of opinion only. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Rafe Mayer, former B.C. Cabinet Minister, but more importantly, Canada's most successful talk show host. Welcome to the show, Rafe. Thank you very much. Nice to talk to you, Jim. Interesting election results in Alberta, the NDP being elected there for the very first time, booting out a government that had been in power for 44 years. Yep. Well, you know, it's interesting, Jim, uh, how smart the Conservatives were when the oil prices were up and how dumb they became when they went down, you know? That's what happens. I was talking to a, a candidate for Parliament, I won't mention his name, just not long ago, and he was saying, well, you know, what about economic policy? And I said, well, you know, you politicians seem to forget that 99% of that's offshore and you don't have much to do about it. And, of course, too, uh, Jim Prentice apparently uh, didn't just plan to raise business taxes. He raised 59 different fees and brought back medical premiums, something Albertans hadn't paid for a long time. So he was hitting people in the pocketbook. Nothing like that to remind people that they can vote for somebody else. Well, of course, that's that's right. And, uh, you know, taxes uh, do that to you. It's uh, He was in a difficult position. And uh, I, I think a lot of it goes way, way back. You know, Alberta just got so used to being rich. They got fat and sassy. They had their their heritage fund for so many years that I remember Peter Law, he used to always boast about when I was back on constitutional conferences. And uh, uh, somehow along the way, they uh, they forgot where they were supposed to be going. They spent all that. And uh, again, I think what happened is that they just assumed because it had gone on so well for so long that nothing would ever happen to oil prices. And, uh, and that's what they really depended upon. You know, it's really, a, apart from agriculture at this point, it's really a, a sort of a a uh, one product economy and uh, when you have that it's, it's really tough a lot of people are saying that rachel notley uh, realizes she's the mayor of a one industry town and won't do a lot to upset the oil patch oh i don't think that she can you know it's really the only game in town uh her uh, problem is going to be to, to raise money i think she'll probably hurt them uh, by hitting them with some taxes and so on uh, but uh, she can't do much uh, other than that. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's just one of those things you can't do much about. It's sort of like I remember back in the in the 70s when uh, the NDP were uh, about to come in, and uh, or over 60s, I guess, no, 70s, early 70s, and they were talking loud and long about uh, forestry and how we're chopping down too many trees and so on and so forth, and, and when they got in, they realized, well, that's how B.C. in those days made its entire living, and you really couldn't do much about it. And uh, I suppose when we went in, there were some realizations like that, too. Uh, I've always said, you know, Jim, one of the interesting things about running for politics, it's a hell of a lot easier to run the province when you're sitting in a bar having a drink with your friends than it is in the cabinet room. Well, I was going to say, you know, if uh, people who knew everything to solve it, we'd elect nobody but cab drivers and hairdressers. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Rafe, how hard is it? to come in as a rookie and run a government. I mean, I've never been in that kind of position. Is it really what uh, Mr. Diefenbaker said a long time ago, that uh, really running government is doing precision surgery with blunt instruments? (laughs) Well, that's not bad. It's a lot like that. Uh, You know, from a practical point of view, Jim, I think one of the problems is that you go into government fresh from all of the election rhetoric that you've been involved in on both sides. Uh, you know, what the other guys are going to do and what you're going to do, et cetera. And you, you get into that cabinet room and you say, okay, let's take number one on the list. Oh, whoopsie daisy, you know, we, we can't abolish ICBC today. Well, let's take number two. Well, no, I don't think we can get rid of the land freeze today. Let's take a look at number three. And by the time you're through the list of all the things you squawked about in the election, you find that you can't do anything about them. And the other things are pretty routine government. It's, it's, it's really a, a, it's a sobering, uh, feeling. And, uh, I use the cocktail lounge. I, that, that happened to me. I went back to Kamloops after about three months in cabinet and ran into all my old pals and the Stockman's bar, the guys that had got me in the, <laughs> in the first place. And they said, well, how is it, Rafe? And I said, well, it's a hell of a lot easier to run it here with you guys over a couple of drinks than it is when you get in the cabinet room. And that's very true. One of the things that Rachel Notley will have to do is work with a band of rookie MLAs, and a lot of those candidates were like last-minute write-ins who have no real political background at all. They just filled in a space on the ballot. Well, that's true. Uh, Going on my own experience, I can only say that I was a rookie, and uh, Jim Nielsen and one or two others were, but 
uh, Bill Bennett did have some uh, some experienced people. He had the uh, the liberals and Gardam uh, McGear, and of course Alan Williams, who was a brick, and he had Grace McCarthy, who had been in a cabinet with W. A. C. Bennett, and so on. So he uh, and he had a number of others who at least had been in the legislature and had seen you know how things work. So I, I don't know what the hell you do when you have nobody that's ever been there before. It's uh, it's got to be very very daunting, very challenging. I've heard that the most important appointment she will have to make is energy minister. Well, I would think it is, and just what they're going to do with that, I don't know. You know, she's already committed to uh, uh, going slow on pipelines and that sort of thing, uh, as she well would have to do, and uh, I just don't know what she's going to do with that. Uh, uh, I guess uh, one of the things she's going to do is uh, be like uh, sort of like Mr. McCobber, hope somebody something turns up like the oil prices go up. But she's, she hasn't got a hell of a lot of options, Jim. And the energy minister is going to, you know, I wouldn't want to be the energy minister in that government. Thank you very much. Yes, and, uh, of course, when the economy turns down, you don't have a lot of wiggle room. And also, if she wants to raise royalties on oil and natural gas, again, with the prices so low, you're not going to get a lot of money anyway, and you may discourage more investment. Oh, there's no question about that. The only thing about going in as energy minister now is if the prices do go up, you look like a genius. But, uh, you know, other than that, it's just, it's going to be hard. No, she can't. Uh, you can't raise royalties when they're, they're not taking out any oil and natural gas to speak of. And when they are, they're taking it out at a bare minimum price anyway. They're having trouble making money. It's, it's going to, it's a tough road to hoe for. And, and I think Prentice was the one who planned to boost business taxes from 10 to 12 percent. But as someone so correctly pointed out, if that business is losing money, you make no revenue and you don't get any new investment because of the higher tax. No, that's true. And of course, you know, they always say I was going to, too. If, if he'd done that before the election, it might have turned out a little differently because people were very unhappy at having to pay the taxes personally and, and seeing the corporations in their mind, at any event, getting away with it. But, oh, you're right. You, you know, you just can't get blood from a stone. And, uh, uh, Ms. Notley has really got a, a tough road to hoe. She's, uh, suddenly woken up as the winner, the prime, uh, premier, et cetera. And then tomorrow comes, and she's got to figure out what the hell to do, and that's not going to be easy. Well, for myself, I grew up in Peace River, 500 clicks north of Edmonton, and Fairview, the town that Rachel's from, Fairview is just 60 miles away from Peace River. And I don't know if she had the same kind of uh, bringing up as I did there. It's mostly farming, but you know the oil patch isn't far away, and if you don't keep all of that healthy, uh, the provincial economy really will suffer. No question about that. I, As I say, I just don't know how she's going to do it. It's it's almost, you know, as if uh, somebody came into BC now as premier with the budworm uh, problem and nothing else. You know, at least British Columbia has other things going for it that can, can, you know, it, it can fill the gap to some extent. But uh, in Alberta, unless they, as a lot of them are hoping to do, get some uh, uh, green uh, economy, some part of the green economy going, and so on, they really have agriculture and they've got oil and natural gas and not a hell of a lot else. Some tourism, but uh, you know pretty tough yeah and i've also wondered why alberta didn't do more to make products from all their petroleum instead of just shipping the petroleum south well i think this is a question that a lot of people ask for a long time and uh, I, I can remember I, I don't want to name drop it uh, uh, i can remember bill bennett and i and uh, sitting down and a couple of others uh, in edmonton one time at a conference and saying to ourselves and to each other, I wonder, wonder why they don't do more than just dig it out and ship it. I mean, there must be a lot of other things you can do with this, uh, uh, value added that's going to make it, you know, easier if the market for raw oil goes, goes down the tube. And, uh, you know, you're, you raise a good question. I just don't know. It's the same question that a lot of people have been asking for years about lumber in British Columbia. And uh, I'm no expert on that. I'm no expert on anything, but not on that particularly. But I think we're doing better at it now than we used to do. But uh, uh, it's, it's sort of the raw log syndrome. If you ship the raw logs out, then the value added goes to where the logs go. And uh, that doesn't create any jobs or any taxes. We'll have more with Rafe Mayer right after this. More and more people are looking to the Internet for intelligent, riveting, and thought-provoking interviews. To advertise on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com, call 604-699-8600, 604-699-8600. In Goddard We Trust. Welcome back. We're speaking with Rafe Mayer. Rafe, 
is the Alberta an election uh, really an opportunity for BC to run ads in that province saying, hey, we're still open for business, come on down, the water's fine? I wonder whether that would be a wise thing to do in the longer run, because it isn't always going to be this way, and you create it at a government-to-government level, certainly that would create a lot of hard feeling. As far as industries themselves are concerned, I, I, I just don't know the answer to that. You know, that it's it seems to me to be as much of a PR exercise as, as anything else. There will be, however, uh, people that they, they don't need a lot of advertising. Uh, people in Alberta have a pretty good idea what it's going to mean to their particular business, and they're going to make up their own minds. Mind you, Jim, you know, you remember, I remember back very well, when the NDP came in in British Columbia, the entire province was going to move to Alberta. Well, some did, and uh, but not very many, and, and many of them came back. So a lot of that is hot air, too. you got you got to realize that, uh, you know, it's, it doesn't necessarily mean that these guys really mean what they're saying or that they will take all the good stuff to your province. They may leave the good stuff behind. So it, it's, a, it's a hard problem to figure out, but some will move. There's no doubt about that. Well, I know Allison Redford and, of course, Christy Clark did not have uh, the warmest of relations, but... Uh, I'm just saying off the cuff, maybe Rachel Notley what likes white wine, and I know Christy does. <laughs> well, you know, we've got lots of that for them. And, uh, uh, you know, there, there was an enlightened consumer and corporate affairs minister back in 1978 that got all that started in the Okanagan and elsewhere, the, the cottage winery and the huge wine industry, which is going now. Now, modesty prevents me from telling you who that enlightened minister was. Yes, and I also remember uh, Bill Vanderzam paying uh, wineries to rip up their cheap red wine vines, paying them, and then saying, wait, folks, wait until you get this nice Riesling and other wines that grow in your soil. You're going to start winning awards. Yeah, And well, that, that worked, too. Oh, absolutely. It's, it, it's a miracle. You know, one of these days that whole story will be told, and we're off subject, I know, but my old deputy, Tex Enamark, was out. We had lunch together yesterday, and... Uh, we were talking about those days because it all started with a couple of uh, of uh, fruit ranchers coming down and, and saying to the Minister of Agriculture, we can't make a go of it because the Americans are dumping apples into the market. We can't sell our land because of the land freeze, et cetera. Can we have some cottage winery or can we have a cottage winery license? And uh, that was completely and utterly unknown then. And, uh, and it took us about six or eight months before we got all organized with uh, – special deals for them in the liquor store and special deals on on markups and so on and so forth and uh, from that tiny little beginning look what we've got it's just amazing and it's nice to see too that the government is recognizing the importance of microbreweries and their connection with restaurants i remember a time that was illegal then they allowed a few yeah in the u.s now those same kind of breweries exported a hundred million dollars worth of beer. Another opportunity for BC, I would think. Oh, absolutely! Uh, you're hitting a lot of sore points with me today, Jim. Uh, when I was uh, was minister back a long, long time ago, uh, the big eastern breweries came and bought out all our local breweries, and they all promised to put out the same beer that we'd always had. Well, they were liars. The uh, next thing we had, we had one size fits all right across Canada. Uh, I got so that I wouldn't drink a bottle of. Uh, of Canadian beer again, unless it was all that was around. And for me, that's saying something. And, and now, of course, it's reversed itself. We're getting our own breweries back, microbreweries and so on. And it's a wonderful thing to behold. But uh, it was a time, I'll tell you, and uh, no wonder I'm almost a BC separatist. Yeah, well, <laughs> you know, I've lived here most of my life, and uh, to try to pull me out of here, you're really going to have to use some pretty strong horses. Well, that's that's funny, you know, I... As I say, we're way off the topic here, I guess, but uh, Tex and I and uh, one of our uh, other uh, deputies, a fellow named Perry Anglin, who lives in Ottawa now, we were all sitting out in the Lions Bay Cafe having a, some lunch, and uh, and Perry looked at me, he says, you know, Ray, the trouble with you is you've never lived anywhere else. If you live in the rest of Canada, you'd have a much broader perspective. And I pointed my arm out to, to the Howe Sound, across to Gambier Island and Bowen Island, et cetera, and I said, I would you leave this if you had this every day of your life? And he said, no, I wouldn't. You know, So there you are. And, and Rafe, okay, let's get off topic even further. Uh, fashion. Now, you asked if anybody listened to the Goddard Report. I think a comment somebody made about maternity fashion uh, really hit the headlines, made all the major media in the Vancouver area. Yes, I area. heard all about that. And uh, apparently Fox News in the U.S. picked it up as well. Well, you have a book coming out in August, 
and fashion becomes a statement in there as well. Maybe tell people about how fashions change, and maybe you got to keep up with the times. Well, you know, it, it's funny how fashions really, really annoy parents. And uh, I must say, because of my own experience, uh, when I had kids, we let them wear what the kids of the day wore. But I can remember so well in the uh, towards the end of the Second World War when the zoot suit suddenly became fashionable. Now, the real zoot suit came up from the United States, and it was quite a sight to behold. Uh, big, long jackets with uh, uh, padded uh, uh, shoulders, uh, long watch chains, uh, pants that were about, uh, oh, 30 or 35 inches at the knee and down to so narrow at the at the ankle that they had some of these zippers, and they had a big, broad hat over their eyes, et cetera, and they, they really did look pretty funny. But the parents of the world just set their hair on fire. And uh, even for us kids living on the west side, uh, we didn't uh, get into the zoot suit particularly, but we all wanted to have draped pants. And I can remember coming home with a pair of draped pants. I'd gone down to On Woe Taylor in Vancouver, and I'd had a pair of gray flannels made into uh, 28 16s, 28 at the knee and 16 at the cuff. And I thought that my mother and father were going to throw me out forever. They were just outraged at this. Now, Jim, we're talking about a pair of pants. You know, we're not, not talking about uh, shooting heroin or something, but parents just can't live with the changes that kids like to make, and kids know that, and they love to go to their parents, just like we did. Brave, your mom didn't even like the hair you wore when you were a kid. Oh, no. And, you know, it's amazing how the hair fashions change. Uh, I think I was mentioning to you a little while ago that uh, when I was a teenager, uh, the uh, haircut was a crew cut. And uh, my mother just uh, just uh, was appalled at, at that. And I would have to sneak out and get my hair cut so it was a fait accompli. And I'd have my crew cut. Well, by the time I'd got uh, past that and I guess barely through college, everybody's uh, all male's hair were down to their, their ankles. So it just like changes overnight. And in each case, the parents went nuts. You know, why in the hell my mother would worry because I had a crew cut? If she only knew, she had a lot more than that to worry about. But uh, she uh, she fretted over the crew cut, and I I guess other uh, parents later on fretted about the kids with long hair. It uh, it, it taught my uh, my wife and me a lesson, though we uh, we just let the kids you know wear what they wanted to uh, to wear and have their hair the way they wanted to have it. But I'll tell you a funny little story. I uh, I got a beard early, and I was about twelve, and I started to get peach fuzz. And by the time I went to high school, uh, I, I really looked like a fuller brush. And uh, my parents wouldn't let me shave because I was only 13 and I was too young. Now, think about that. I went to school. The kids all teased me. The girls particularly teased me. And, you know, it was an awful thing to put up with. All I had to do was cut it off, and they wouldn't let me. And one day my uh, mother said, well, your dad and I have been talking, and uh, because the mustache is now down in your mouth, maybe you should cut that off. And so I got a razor and I said to hell with it and cut everything off and there we were but you know there they were sitting there just just going crazy because their son who happened to have a premature peach fuzz infestation on his face uh, uh wanted to shave it off you know it's 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 it's, uh, it's amazing and then of course uh, it wasn't all that long later that uh, kids of uh, 15 and 60 my own son had beards down to their knees you know it's <laughs> it's, it's it's funny when you look back on it you know, I'll tell you this, uh, and if parents are listening, I can tell you, uh, I very much resented uh, that business with the beard because here I was going to school and just getting a hell of a time from everybody over something that could be so simply taken care of. And uh, yeah, I re- that's one of the few things I resent out of a very happy childhood. Well, there was once a very famous public speaker who said, Kids today, they have no respect for their elders, they're ignorant, they don't know the past, they think the future is everything, we have no hope for society. That speaker, Pluto. Ah, yeah, that's right. Why can't they be like we were perfect in every way? What's the matter with kids today? <laughs> well, well, I know this had a lot to do with the Alberta election, but sometimes, Rafe, I think it does, sometimes change is a good thing. Oh, absolutely, and after 44 years, it has to happen, you know, I just I caught I was spent the whole day writing articles today because I've got several people that I write for and uh, I, I, I mentioned to to one of them when you have a dictatorship, whether it's a malevolent one or a benevolent one, when it falls, it falls with a huge crash, and that's what they had in Alberta. It was a benevolent dictatorship, but it was a dictatorship, uh, one party for 44 years, and uh, when that goes, boy, it goes whoosh and. Uh, I think the Conservatives are gone for a long time. 
I think the Wild Rose Party, a miracle coming back from, you know, uh, self-immolation in December, I think they're going to build up uh, like the old Social Credit Party was there and here, and I think they'll be the opposition, and they sooner or later will be the next government. And I think the Conservative Party is dead. Uh, how about the career of Jim Prentice? Oh, well, I think he's just made up his mind. He's going. Uh, I, don't, I don't. Is he a lawyer? I don't know much about him personally, but uh, uh, I would think he said he's out of politics, and I, I wouldn't be at all surprised. Where does he go? Uh, you know, the prime minister he left in Ottawa uh, isn't the most popular cat in the world right now. Uh, he'd have to get a nomination to go back. I don't know why he would want to go back and possibly be a backbencher in Ottawa. Uh, he's resigned. I'm told he's resigned to seat that he just won last night. So I don't know where he goes from there. Well, I know usually when you're the leader of a losing party in an election, it's traditional to hand in your resignation. Yeah, usually you wait a day or two, though, you know, before you <laughs> run up on your sword. But uh, there we are. He didn't. And, Perhaps uh, he felt that they were going to ride him out of town on a rail. Well, that's right. I don't know. You know, they could have tarred and feathered him because the tar right now I hear is cheap. Yeah, that's right. Very cheap. Yeah. <laughs> well, I've got I've got only one bit of perfection in my life. I never lost an election, so I really don't know what it's like. I I can imagine how well I would have taken it, being the hard loser I am. <laughs> yes. Right. <laughs> well, I know the Grim Reapers tried to grab you a couple of times, oh. and and you've spit in his face. Too close for comfort. <laughs> Three times in four months. Rafe, he's not going to win unless you want him to. Oh, well, that's that's true. You know, it's, that's true of life in general. And uh, you keep on plugging on and uh, trying to win. Rafe, thanks a lot for chatting with us. Jim, it's, it's always a great pleasure. Check out Rafe's website, rafeonline.com. You're listening to the Goddard Report on TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Find us on Twitter at TalkDigitalNet. Check out our popular YouTube channel, Talk Digital Network. Comments about the show can be sent to info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Comments made on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com are an expression of opinion only. The Goddard Report is available online and mobile at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. The Goddard Report is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.